the age of 18, I dropped out of university. After one semester, I realized I didn't know what career path my studies were leading towards. So I quit. I didn't know where I was going from there. But I started working in a call center. I didn't have a plan, but over the next five years, I managed to climb the corporate ladder. And by the age of 23, I was working for the company named as Australia's most attractive employer, managing improvement projects, being paid more than most graduates. I was flying the world business class. I met Richard Branson. I had a car, I had a nice apartment, I had a personal trainer. I was independent and going places. I had ticked all the boxes to becoming a responsible and successful adult. I didn't realize this at the time, but that success was the beginning of my quarter-life crisis. Things unexpectedly changed. I came home from work one day, and all of a sudden I had this intense feeling of nausea, and I couldn't stand. The next thing I knew, I was in hospital. My heart rhythms weren't aligned, I couldn't digest food, and I was having seizures and muscle spasms. I spent the next week in hospital with doctors trying to figure out what was wrong with me. I went from being a fit and healthy 23-year-old to being unable to walk to the end of my driveway. And I had to move back in with my parents. The doctors weren't able to tell me exactly what was wrong with me. But they did say that I showed symptoms of chronic fatigue syndrome. And what that really meant was that at 23, I was living an unsustainable life, all because I wanted to be successful. <laughs> Growing up, I was taught that if I got a good grade, <laughs> then I would get into good universities, that I would get a good job, that I would get married, have kids, continue on the same career path, and then retire comfortably. Success was defined as a linear pathway of stability and security. That was success for my parents, and what my parents saw as success for me. But in my case, despite having this great job with great perks, I questioned my value against others because I didn't have a degree. Despite having money, I didn't feel rich. Despite my achievements, I didn't feel successful. I was allowing the approval of others to define what success meant for me. And it turns out, I wasn't the only one feeling this way. I am a millennial, and that means someone born roughly between 1980 and the year 2000. Millennials report the highest levels of stress compared with any other generation. And that stress is causing more and more young people to experience what is now being called a quarter-life crisis. So what does that mean? The University of London has defined a quarter-life crisis as a commitment or a set of commitments within a life structure that is no longer desired but is not yet perceived as a realistic target of change. Now, what that means is that we want things to be different, but we're not sure if or how we can move forward. Now, I am sure you've heard the stereotypes. Millennials are the narcissistic, entitled, technology-obsessed youth of today. But we don't even have a high opinion of ourselves with 36% of millennials considering themselves responsible and only 23% of millennials considering themselves hardworking. Yet, interestingly, we are the most optimistic when it comes to our careers. We're not just soul-searching for our passion. We are moving away from this traditional linear pathway of success. We don't just want work-life balance. We want work-life integration. We want flexibility, sustainability, purpose, and intrinsic motivation. We want a life where our social interactions, personal wellness, 
creative ambitions and careers are intertwined to create a positive impact. But millennials face a unique set of challenges. Recently, it was suggested by a millionaire, Tim Gurner, that millennials cannot afford to get on the property market because we eat too much avocado on toast. <laughs> and I'll admit, I eat a lot of avocado on toast. And I also don't own a house. But really, the odds are against us. We earn 30% less than baby boomers did at our age. Property is at an all-time high. We have grown up in a very unique set of political and economic circumstances. And not only that, but we are the most highly educated generation ever. And we're also the most in debt. <laughs> Our student loans in England, the average is 32,000 pounds. Yet in today's economy and job market, that no longer guarantees us work or continuous income, let alone personal satisfaction. Now, let me put that in perspective for you. If I was a businessman and I came to you with an offer to invest 32,000 pounds in my business with no guarantee of return, would you take it? Probably not. The old model of success doesn't work for millennials. If we change how we perceive success, then society will change with us. In previous generations, success was about fitting into predetermined roles. So, if the increase of stress in millennials is being caused by a conflict between wanting to shape an individual identity but trying to fit into these predetermined ideas of what success is, then a key factor in overcoming a quarter-life crisis is to start redefining success. This new model of success starts with us letting go of these preconceived norms in a shift towards individuality. So how do millennials make that shift? A key factor in millennials moving towards this individualized success model is reducing unhealthy and unrealistic comparisons to others. For technology-obsessed millennials, that means becoming emotionally aware of how we react to social media. In the age of baby boomers, if you went to your 10-year high school reunion, it was probably the first time you'd seen or heard of anyone in years. Now, you can follow everyone you've ever met, their achievements, and not just people you've met, the entire world. And that has the potential to be empowering and educational but it also has the potential to have negative effects on us. It encourages an idea of a perfectionist culture. Now, if you are a millennial, consider how you portray yourself online. Is it authentic? An American psychologist, Carl Rogers, theorized that our personalities mean that every human instinctually wants to realize their full potential. And this process is called self-actualization. And what that means is that we have an idea of what our real self is and what our ideal self is. People become fully functioning when the real self and the ideal self are most closely aligned. Now, the problem with this online portrayal is that most people are shifting towards a version of their ideal selves. And it can become problematic because, A, we have to live up to this idea that we've portrayed online, and also we start comparing our real self with someone else's ideal self. When I was ill, did I post about my struggles? No, because I was worried about how people might perceive me. So here's a question. If everyone portrayed an authentic version of themselves on social media, would people still feel the same pressures of comparison? And this leads me to arguably a more important question, that whether the problem lies with a culture of perfectionism or with our interpretation of the information. Are millennials taking responsibility for how they're emotionally responding to seeing certain posts? 
If everyone is portraying an ideal heightened versions of themselves online, then millennials are all contributing to the problem. As millennials, we are all responsible. Having the awareness of how you portray yourself online and how you respond emotionally is empowering. Millennials need to be accountable and self-aware as individuals. And as a society, if we are going to encourage this move towards individualized success. And these principles of comparison, they don't just apply to online. Recently, I realized something, that it's become fashionable to be busy. I go out for coffee with my friends, and they'll ask me how I am. And I'll say, yeah, I'm great, I'm really busy. Since when did it become cool to be busy? <laughs> busy doesn't equal successful, and busy doesn't equal productive. <sighs> so, what I'm trying to say is that millennials are a yes generation, and we're inclined to take on more than we can realistically achieve. So, if the aim is to move towards a more individualized model of success, then we need to start valuing individual time. If you are a millennial, allow yourself permission to say no. For me, what works is setting one single daily priority and having the hierarchy of other tasks fall around that priority. Time management and prioritization needs to become an intuitive part of how you live and work if you want to feel a sense of progression and achievement in this movement towards individualized success. Now, I'm going to take you back to my story briefly. It's been five years now since I quit my job and I moved to London to become an actress. In the process of my recovery, in the midst of my quarter-life crisis, I realized I had a choice. I looked at my bosses and I saw the extensive hours they were working and that was it. I realized I didn't want that. And this leads me to arguably the most important step of overcoming my quarter life crisis, that realizing that knowing what you don't want is sometimes more important than knowing what you do want. I felt in many ways that I had failed by quitting my job and taking on a new career. How do I justify the loss of time? What about that solid resume that I'd build up? What about all those skills that I no longer might not be able to use? The answer is you don't have to justify it. The investment of study, time or skill isn't lost by changing your trajectory. Millennials need to shift away from the traditional linear model of success because if studies are true, that every two in three millennials want to move on from their current career path by the year 2020, then we need to start championing a culture towards trial and error. Now, I'm not saying that every millennial should quit their job, move abroad, and find a new career path. That is not going to solve a quarter-life crisis. But what I am saying is that millennials have a choice. In fact, we have a world of choice. The choice to change the circumstances that leave us feeling stuck, to turn risk into reward. Millennials have the potential to change the traditional ideas of success, and it's already happening. We are not bound by a blueprint. We are not defined by our job titles, our education, our relationships, or our wallets. If you are a millennial, ask yourself, what does risk mean to you? How far would you be willing to go beyond your comfort zone to find an individual idea of success? How often do you feel actively challenged? Because how else do we discover our potential? Defining success on your own terms is not only about reducing comparisons and valuing your time, it's about developing an optimistic and tolerant attitude towards risk, the willingness to explore, 
and the persistence beyond traditional ideas of failure towards a greater sense of authenticity and expressiveness. For my part, I'm pursuing a life agenda that is anything but traditional. I'm a 27-year-old actress living abroad. I haven't made it in Hollywood or the West End yet. And to sustain my lifestyle, I teach children. And I've started my own business. Because being an actor doesn't always pay the bills. Only 2% of actors are employed at any one time. And rejection is part of my weekly routine. I haven't decided if I'll marry or if I'll ever want to marry. I don't know where I'll be in five years' time. It may be somewhere completely different. And I haven't averted stress. <laughs> Many would consider that I've chosen a life more complicated. And I've asked myself, are the stresses of pursuing a traditional model of success any different to the stresses of pursuing an individual model of success? And the answer is probably not. But I have purpose, and I feel happy with where I am right now. What would it take for you to feel like you're achieving your full potential? How can you develop self-awareness, acceptance, and courage to allow yourself permission to define success on your own terms? Do you have to go to university? Changing your career path doesn't mean you've given up. You don't have to be a slave to routine. It's a choice. Eat your avocado on toast. And yes, you're going to have to work hard. You're going to have to work really hard. Because learning what you don't want and what you want, it takes time. But if you develop self-awareness, allow yourself time to grow, and commit to your choices without judgment, then you allow yourself creative autonomy. Millennial success is about shaping individual identity.